Life is God. Philippians 1, 18b to 21. Brothers and sisters, dear friends, what are you living for? Who are you living for? What is your supreme passion in life? For some of us, school is life. Our lives revolve around our studies. But often a good education is just a stepping stone to a good job. And for some of us, work is life. But for many, at the end of the day, work is just a means to an end, a way to make ends meet, to provide for one's family. And after one is finished with one's education and with one's career, Lord willing, family will still be there. So for many, family is life. For others, sports is life. Many basketball players and athletes have used this common catchphrase on the court, ball is life, ball is life. A lot of people eat, sleep, and breathe sports. For them, it's more than a game. Ball is life. But of course, there will come a time in their life where they will no longer have the physical ability to play that sport. Not to mention after putting hours and hours into their sport, perhaps ever since elementary school, many people eventually realize that they don't have the skills to play after high school. For most of us with MBA aspirations, all that ball is life talk tends to fade away after age 18. And frankly, most of our athletic careers end by the time we're 22. At that point, what are we living for? After we finish with school, what are we living for? When we've taken our last exam, what are we living for? When we finally get that piece of paper, what are we living for? Is school still life? When we get laid off, what are we living for? When our company goes out of business, what are we living for? When we retire, what are we living for? Is work still life? When family moves out, what are we living for? When a family breaks up, what are we living for? When family passes away, what are we living for? Is family still life? You know, so many people are always chasing the ever-changing concept of the good life. Many just want to be able to say, life is good. But Paul tells the Philippians that for him, come what may, life is God. Life is God. Like Paul, Christ is who we should be living for. The gospel should be what we're living for. Our supreme passion should be our Savior. Our greatest goal should be God's glory. And if Jesus is life, then death is gain. For we will meet him face to face in glory. If we seek to be a living sacrifice for the Lord, then death means our living sacrifice will be complete. If Christ is life, then death means everlasting life with Christ. Whether or not people say life is good, we can always say, life is God. Now, in context, as you may recall, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi while in chains. Philippians, along with Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, are often called the prison epistles. After opening the letter with greetings, thanksgiving, and prayer, in Philippians 1.12, it says, Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have brought about more advancement of the gospel. Philippians 1.12. And let's just briefly review exactly what these circumstances were. I'd just like to set the stage so we can understand the background of Paul's letter. So, if you read Acts 21 and following, you'll see that after arriving in Jerusalem and going to the temple, Paul's presence and previous preaching results in a riot. As you read beginning at Acts 21.30, it says, The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Verse 33, the commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd shouted one thing and some another. 
and since Commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, Get rid of him. That's Acts 21, 30-36. Brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. When you spread the true gospel, you're bound to make some people mad. And as you'll find in Scripture, Paul made a lot of people mad and endured a lot of persecution. Paul's life is threatened several times. And this time, as you'll see in Acts 21, 37 to 22, 21, that is Acts 21, 37 to chapter 22, verse 21, in front of a bloodthirsty mob, Paul proclaims the good message of our blood-shedding master. Though he's in a bad condition, Paul testifies about the good news of Christ. He recounts his Damascus Road experience and proclaims the way of salvation for Jews and Gentiles. And they weren't too crazy about that. As you read in Acts 22, 21 to 22, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Acts 22, 21 to 22. He said, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And the Jews were not too crazy about that. In life, to Christ, Paul wants to be dedicated. But they just want him dead. Eventually, Paul testifies and defends himself before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court. See Acts 22.30 to Acts 23.10. And in Acts 23.11-13, it says, The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. Acts 23, 11-13. Now, fortunately, those guys were going to have to go a little hungry for a little while. Before they could kill him, Paul's nephew alerts the commander about their plan, and the soldiers transfer him to Caesarea, where Governor Felix resides. Then Paul testifies and defends himself in a trial before Governor Felix and shares the gospel with the governor and his Jewish wife, Drusilla. See Acts 24, 1 to 26. And in verse 25 to 27, it says, As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Verse 27, when two years had passed, two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant the favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. That's Acts 24, 25 to 27. You see, the gospel may sound nice to people when we talk about heaven. But when we start talking about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, people often don't want to hear much about that. In any case, after making his case, Paul waits in prison in Caesarea for two years. Could you imagine waiting in prison for two years just to appear before a judge? Back then, they had no right to a quick and speedy trial. It takes two years before another governor, Governor Festus, takes office and then finally sees Paul. And in Acts 25, 1-3, it says, Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus, as a favor to them, to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Acts 25, 1-3 Now it's been years since the riots in Jerusalem, and they were still trying to kill Paul. I do bet that some of those guys had a sandwich by then, though. They had sworn an oath to not eat before they killed him. I think they probably had a you know, little something to eat before then. It's been two years. In any case, Festus goes back to Caesarea with some of the Jewish leaders, and Paul stands trial again. After defending himself against more false accusations, Festus asks if he wants to go back to Jerusalem to stand trial. See Acts 25, 4-9. But in Acts 25, 10-12, it says, Paul answered, 
I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Verse 12, after Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. Acts 25, 10-12. You see, as a Roman citizen, Paul had the right to have his case heard before the Roman emperor. So Paul is going to head to Rome. Before that, however, King Agrippa and his sister Bernice come to Caesarea to see Festus. And Festus discusses Paul's case with King Agrippa. See Acts 25, 13 and 21. Then in verse 22 it says, Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. That's Acts 25, 22. So Paul stands trial again, this time before King Agrippa and Bernice. And he testifies about his Damascus Road experience again. See Acts 25, 23 to Acts 26, 32. In Acts 26, 20 to 23, it says, First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and then all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Acts 26, 20 to 23. In spite of all Paul has been through, in spite of his suffering, he still spreads the gospel, the good news of the resurrected Messiah, the resurrected Christ. And he's preaching to kings and governors. Continuing at verse 28, then Agrippa said to Paul, this is the king, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. After they had left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Acts 26, 28-32. So Paul gets his wish. He's about to go to Rome to testify, not only for his own case, but for the case for Christ. So it looks like things might be turning around for Paul. But soon after they set sail, Paul warns them about a coming storm, but they don't listen. See Acts 27, 1-12. The storm comes. They have to throw the cargo overboard to keep from sinking. They go without food for 14 days, and they shipwreck on a sandy beach. See Acts 27, 13 and 44. If that wasn't bad enough, when they land on the island of Malta, Paul gets bit by a snake. See Acts 28, 1 to 6. But thanks be to God, he just shakes it off and actually starts healing others on the island. See Acts 28, 7 to 10. Then, after three months on the island of Malta, they finally sail to Rome, and Paul preaches to Jews while under his house arrest. See Acts 28, 11 to 22. And starting at verse 33 of Acts 28, it says, They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Acts 28, 23 to 24. And in the last verses of the book of Acts, it says, For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Acts 28, 30 to 31 the end of the book of Acts. Now, early in Acts 19, Paul said he had to go to Rome to preach the gospel. See Acts 19, 21. Now he is finally there, but as a prisoner. 
Now, it's possible that Paul writes Philippians during an early imprisonment in Caesarea or while he was in Ephesus. On several occasions, Paul was jailed for Jesus. But many scholars believe that it is at this time, in Acts 28, as a Roman prisoner under house arrest around AD 61 and 63, that Paul writes Philippians and the other prison epistles. And after being arrested, threatened by a mob, plotted against, beaten, flogged, imprisoned, dragged from judgment hall to judgment hall, and even shipwrecked, Paul once again says in Philippians 1.12, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have brought about more advancement of the gospel. And we just read about his circumstances. That's Philippians 1.12. You see, the more Paul went through, the more the gospel was spread. And all of this, and all he endured, Paul sees God's hand. Even though Paul was imprisoned, there was progress through his pain. The Philippians, they may have wrote to him and asked how he was doing. But Paul seems more concerned with how well the gospel was doing. It was advancing. Through all he's been through, the gospel has gone forth. Despite his possible execution, he knows that God is executing his plan. Though Paul is in chains, the gospel is set free. Then in Philippians 1, 13 and 14, it says, For this reason, it has become clear throughout the whole praetorium, that is the palace guard, and to all others, that my chains are for Christ's sake. And most of the brothers and sisters, having become confident in the Lord because of my chains, have even more courage to speak the word without fear. Philippians 1, 13 and 14. You see, Paul's chains were actually beneficial for the cause of Christ. For others gained the courage to dare to declare the gospel. That being said, Philippians 1, 15 to 18a says, On the one hand, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, while on the other hand, some do so out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I have been appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to raise up hardship for me in my chains. So what? Nevertheless, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and for this I rejoice. It's Philippians 1.15 18a. Now, the church in Rome was not founded by Paul. And maybe among the church leadership, Paul's arrival in Rome ruffled some feathers. We don't know for sure. But even if they had false motives, as long as they were preaching the true gospel, Paul is like, Praise the Lord. Paul has joy. You see, if different churches are preaching the same true message, there doesn't need to be a spirit of competition. In contrast to the world, we ought not be on a mission of selfish ambition. If Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches are doing well, praise the Lord. We should have joy, because more Christian brothers and sisters are being added to the family. We should have joy because of the advancement of the gospel. Now, at this point, after talking about the triumphant state of the gospel, Paul now talks about his own state, and he's confident all will turn out for the good. In Philippians 1, 18b to 19, it says, Indeed, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that what has happened to me will turn out for my salvation, through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 18b to 19. Now, this word translated salvation could refer to Paul's vindication. That is, it could mean that after he literally takes the stand for Christ, Paul will be vindicated. That the false accusations leveled against him will be refuted, and he will be released from prison. We could be talking about that kind of vindication. In other words, salvation could refer to him being saved from death, preserved from execution. That being said, Paul uses language that likely alludes to Job 13, 15, and 16, which says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. This will be my salvation that the godless shall not come before him. Job 13, 15 to 16. Paul's words in Philippians are almost identical to the words of Job in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that is the Septuagint, which is abbreviated LXX. 
And in Job 13, despite what his friends say, Job is envisioning standing before the Lord and arguing his case. Therefore, having alluded to Job, Paul is also likely referring to being vindicated not merely before a human court, but the heavenly court. So Paul is likely thinking of ultimate salvation, which does not depend on whether he lives or he dies. Though Paul could be referring to both, he's likely not as concerned with the preservation of his earthly life because he has a reservation for eternal life. And Paul says that he knows that this will all turn out for his salvation, at least in part because of their prayers. Because of their prayers. Paul's already prayed for them. Now he seeks to be assisted by their prayers, the Philippians' prayers. As we sing, I pray for you, you pray for me. Early in Philippians 1, 9-11, Paul prays, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Philippians 1, 9-11 we too should pray that our godly love would abound in godly knowledge and insight, which leads to godly discernment, which leads to godliness. Let's keep growing in our knowledge of God's word so we can grow in the knowledge of God's will. Now, on many occasions, Paul prays for the sanctification and ultimate salvation of his readers. And on many occasions, Paul asks his readers to pray for him for his safety, for the unhindered progress of his ministry, and for his clear, fearless proclamation of the gospel. Now, when we pray, we often focus on physical needs. We often pray for physical healing, financial provision, safe physical travels, and so on. Praying for physical well-being is important, but what's more important is our spiritual well-being. We need to pray for the spiritual well-being of others, especially during times of trial. Here in Philippians, Paul's language suggests that the help or supply of the Spirit is actually tied to the Philippians' prayers. Brothers and sisters, there is power in prayer. As has been said, much prayer, much power. That being said, the only reason prayer has any power is because we pray to the one who has all power. And our all powerful God answers prayers in accordance with his purpose. Now, God is not a mindless divine vending machine that just automatically spits out anything we want in exchange for prayer and praise. And many times we don't even know what to pray for, but as Paul writes in Romans 8, 26-27, in the same way that Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Romans 8, 26-27 The prayers of God's people have power because God's Spirit intercedes for God's people. And the Spirit-led prayers of ours can lead to the spiritual provision of others. Now Paul tells the Philippians that this will all turn out for his salvation because of their prayers and the provision of the Spirit. Provision of the Spirit can refer to the provision that the Spirit himself provides. In this objective sense, the Spirit is the supplier, the Holy Helper. That being said, provision of the Spirit can also refer to the provision of the Spirit himself. In this subjective sense, the Spirit is the supply, the Holy Help. So the Spirit could be the supplier, the Holy Helper, or the supply, the Holy Help Himself. But in a sense, as has been said, the Holy Spirit is both the gift and the giver. The gift and the giver. Now, all Christians have the Holy Spirit. As Paul writes in Romans 8 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Romans 8, verse 9. So all true Christians, all genuine followers of Christ, have the Spirit of Christ. But believers can be empowered by the Spirit even more 
during certain times. This is often called being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. In any case, Paul likely hopes to be filled, helped, and empowered by the Spirit so that he can defend the gospel boldly in court. And more precisely, Paul refers to the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In the entire New Testament, this phrase only appears here. And the Spirit of Jesus Christ likely means the Spirit who was promised and sent by Jesus Christ. You see, in John, Jesus tells his disciples that after he leaves, he will send the Holy Spirit. In John 15, 26, 27, he says, When the Advocate comes, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. John 15, 26, 27. And in John 16, 7, Jesus says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. John 16, verse 7. And in Mark 13, 11, Jesus says, Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Mark 13, 11. So perhaps Paul is referring to this particular ministry of the Holy Spirit, this particular gift of the giver. I mean, if you were about to stand trial, wouldn't you want an advocate to speak for you? Paul's about to testify on trial, so he hopes for help from the Holy Advocate, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Continuing in Philippians 1.20, it says, According to my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but in all boldness, aresia in Greek, as always and especially now, Christ will be exalted, megaluno, in my body, whether through life or through death. Philippians 1.20 You ever have to wait for a ride home? Maybe a bus or a train or a friend with a car? Now, you're sure that the ride is on the way. You just don't know exactly when the ride will arrive. And if you're anything like me, from time to time, you might find yourself craning your neck as you look down the street with eager expectation. You crane your neck looking down the street with eager expectation. Well, the word translated eager expectation in this verse is an intense Greek word that refers to waiting or watching with outstretched head. Waiting or watching with outstretched head. As been said, the word refers to an intense expectation of something that is sure to happen. Paul surely expects that he will not be put to shame and that God will be glorified. Furthermore, as in most cases in the New Testament, as been said, hope does not merely mean wishfulness or hope-filled expectation. As been said, hope concerns something whose coming is certain, but whose timing is uncertain. Whose coming is certain, but whose timing is uncertain. That's biblical hope. Whatever happens and whenever it happens, Paul likely sees his upcoming trial as a divinely appointed opportunity to defend the gospel before his eventual, ultimate salvation. So for Paul, there's no shame in his game. There's no shame in his game. In his upcoming court date, Paul is confident that he will not be disgraced or dishonored or shamed. Now, in Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Romans 1.16. However, here, Paul is likely not referring to personal humiliation or the verdict of his earthly case, his earthly trial. This likely concerns not a human perspective, not a human perspective, but a heavenly perspective. You see, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, being put to shame often referred to the disgrace that fell on those who failed to trust in God. And being put to shame, in this sense, is something that God's humble and faithful people will never experience. 
The Lord's people will never be abandoned. We will never be put to shame. For example, in Romans 9.33, Paul quotes Isaiah 28.16 when referring to the solid rock of Christ. It says, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Romans 9.33 Those who stand on the solid rock, Jesus Christ, are on solid ground. They will not be disgraced or put to shame. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Later in Romans 10, 9-11, Paul says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Romans 10, 9-11, again quoting Isaiah 28, 16. You see, Paul knows he will not be put to shame when he stands as a bold witness for Christ in court. Moreover, Paul is likely again alluding to another Old Testament passage. His language about being put to shame and being exalted recalls Psalm 35, 26-27, which says, May all who gloat over my distress be put to shame and confusion. May all who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and disgrace. May those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, The Lord be exalted, who exalts in the well-being of his servant. Psalm 35, 26-27 So Paul has a sure, eager expectation and hope that he will not be the one who will be put to shame, that he will be vindicated, and that the Lord will be exalted as he testifies with boldness. With boldness. Now, have you ever had to speak frankly to someone who was older than you? Or to someone who was higher than you on the corporate ladder? Someone who outranked you? Many times it's hard to speak boldly to people who are in various positions of power or influence. Sometimes it's challenging to speak boldly to people who have been alive in Christ longer than I've been alive, period. Well, this word translated boldness, paresia, means candor, confidence. As been said, it often refers to outspokenness, especially in the presence of a person of high rank. Recall that Paul has appealed to Caesar. Paul has appealed to Caesar, and Governor Festus said, To Caesar you will go. So Paul is about to testify in the courts of the emperor. He's about to defend the gospel in the heart of the Roman Empire. So Paul is about to testify in the belly of the beast, the heart of the Roman Empire, in Caesar's court. So he's going to need some boldness. And Paul writes something similar to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 6, 19-20, which says, Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Fearlessly is the same word, boldness, aresia. I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Ephesians 6, 19-20 Despite his chains, Paul wants to testify and defend the gospel boldly. He seeks to be a bold witness for Christ, whether in life or in death. Whatever happens, Christ will be Exalted. Now, the word exalt, megaluno, means to cause to be held in greater esteem through praise or deeds, to magnify, to praise. For example, Psalm 34, 3 to 5, which has similar themes and similar language, says, Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt, megaluno, his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. As we said, there's no shame in Paul's game. That's Psalm 34, 3 to 5. Now, in a sense, we cannot make Christ greater. The Lord is already the greatest. 
but though we cannot magnify Christ's greatness, among others we can help magnify his reputation. And that should be our all-consuming passion, to magnify the reputation of the Lord, to exalt the name of our God. When Paul says that Christ will be exalted in his body, this likely means that in everything he does, he wants Christ to be magnified in life or in death. As been said, whether he lives or dies, Paul's supreme ambition is to glorify Christ, no matter the circumstances. Paul wants Christ to be exalted in every aspect of his earthly life, including the moments before his earthly death. If Paul lives, he will continue to exalt Christ in his ministry. If Paul dies, he will exalt Christ in his martyrdom, being faithful to Christ to the very end. You see, these two different paths have the same goal, to glorify Christ. Whether Paul is exonerated or executed, he knows that Christ will be exalted. Christ will be exalted. Because for him, life is God and death is gain. Then in Philippians 1.21, our last verse for the night, Paul says, For to me, to continue living is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21. Now this verse is often translated, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But in the Greek text, the first verb is actually in the present tense, indicating continuity. For Paul, continuing to live is Christ. Living is Christ. His supreme passion of life entails the passion of the Christ. Paul is sustained by and belongs to Christ. For him, a Christ-less life is a meaningless life. Christ is his life, his reason for living. His heavenly point of view puts everything else in perspective. As Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. In 2 Corinthians 5.15, he says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. For some people, school is life. For many, work is life. For others, family is life. Hoopers even say that ball is life. But for Paul, Christ is life. To continue living means more opportunities for ministry. To continue living means more opportunities to exalt Jesus in everything. To continue living means more opportunities to lead people to Christ. And to continue living means more opportunities to become more and more like the Savior, including suffering and sacrifice. Furthermore, Paul's words, ta zein Christas in Greek, are almost identical to a popular Greek saying, zein Christas, which is roughly translated, life is good. So in Paul's day, whereas people would often say, life is good, Paul essentially says, life is God. People would say, life is good. Paul essentially says, life is God. Christ is life. And when Paul says that to die is gain, he's not talking about suicide. Though he had metaphorically died to self in order to live for the Savior. But after death, Paul will be in the immediate presence of Jesus. He'll have a closer communion with Christ, which is better by far, as he says in Philippians 1.23. So for Paul, to die is gain. Moreover, Paul's martyrdom would serve to promote the progress of the gospel. You see, throughout church history, countless people have been inspired by Christian martyrs who were killed for refusing to forsake the faith, even in the face of execution. And the last words of many of those martyrs has been, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We are called to be living sacrifices for the Lord. If we have, when life is over, our living sacrifice is complete. So for us, to die is gain. And though death means an end to earthly suffering, Paul is not merely talking about deliverance from suffering, but being delivered to Christ. 
For those who accept Christ, death is gain. Not merely because earthly problems are ended, but because dwelling in His heavenly presence begins. And for those who reject Christ, death is definitely not a gain. It's a shame. Make no mistake, death is not inherently good. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. That said, if we enjoy the presence of Christ on earth, we will enjoy the presence of Christ in heaven. If Christ is our chief priority, death means chilling with the chief. As has been said, if the most important thing in our life is our relationship with the Lord, then death leads to an even more intimate relationship with our Lord. If Christ is life, then death is gain. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, dear friends, what are you living for? Who are you living for? What is your supreme passion in life? Our supreme passion in life should entail the passion of Christ. We ought not put school before the Savior, nor games before God. We can't put a job before Jesus, nor our family before our faith. So many people are always chasing the ever-changing concept of the good life. Many just want to be able to say, life is good. But Paul tells the Philippians that for him, come what may, life is God. God is life. Christ is life. Like Paul, Christ is who we should be living for. The gospel is what we should be living for. Our supreme passion should be our Savior. Our greatest goal should be God's glory. So in every situation, we should ask ourselves, how can I exalt the name of Christ? How can I magnify the reputation of my Master and Redeemer? And those who trust in Him will never be put to shame. So let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, not just for their physical well-being, but for their spiritual well-being. For the Holy Spirit is our advocate who can help us to endure metaphorical and literal trials and proclaim the gospel with boldness. Paul was literally on trial. And if Jesus is life, then death is gain. For we will meet him face to face in glory. If we seek to be a living sacrifice for the Lord, then death means our living sacrifice will be complete. And if Christ is life, then death means everlasting life with Christ. So whether or not people say life is good, we can always say life is God. May the Lord bless you and keep you.